Hello, everyone! This is Mason Haggett here from the Casino Co Official, and today we are going to be reading Justice Story 2 Goldie and the Seven Stars, Chapter 8 Isaac's Birthday. Narrator Injured humans and dinosaurs come to Perry as he heals them using his natural healing, healing magic and green paint one by one. He is under a tent along with a bunch of other dinosaurs that are doctors and nurses. He heals one last dinosaur as a small lanky dinosaur comes up to him. Geronimo the Struthiomimus. What do you call that green light that comes out of your hands whenever you put them on the wounded? Perry, it's called healing magic. Geronimo the Struthiomimus. Say, how do you learn to use this healing magic? Perry, it takes a long time to master, but he also must be able to use magic. Do you know how to use magic? Geronimo the Struthiomimus. No, I'm afraid I do not. Perry, then your universe probably doesn't naturally have magic. Geronimo the Struthiomimus. In that case, would you like to work for me for a short time? I own a hospital. Perry, no thank you. I'm good. I have enough to do at my own I have enough to do on my plate already. <laughs> Geronimo the Struthiomimus. Oh okay, if you change my mind if you change your mind, let me know. Ooh. Narrator, the Struthiomimus walks away. Perry helps the other plastic dinosaurs and the robots and humans take down the tents as they leave for the night. After this, Perry walks in the rain past all the tank parts, death, and bits and pieces of metal all over the place as he walks towards the looming wreckage of the mighty cannon ship to see if Goldie is inside. Perry. Man, it's been a while. It's been a long time since I've been involved with a war. I wonder how long this war has been going on for. Narrator. The wind picks up. Narrator. The wind picks up some ash as Perry covers his face. Perry. War. It's a sad thing, isn't it? A waste of life over such foolish matters. Narrator. Then he sees Dr. Mustache walks around in circles. But when Dr. Mustache sees Perry, he comes running towards him and falls on his knees. Dr. Mustache. How am I still alive? Please, tell me, how am I still alive? Narrator. Perry gets down on his knees and puts his hand on the doctor's shoulder. Perry. Look, I don't know how you managed to survive my sister's wrath. Or how you were able to survive any of this for that matter. But obviously, if you're still alive after the most bloodthirsty person I know tried to kill you, then you're probably still needed elsewhere. So how about you get up and go for the gold? Narrator, Dr. Mustache is left there on his knees as Perry slowly walks away. But before he could leave, the doctor stops him. Dr. Mustache, wait! I have some unanswered questions, buddy. You can't just walk away after telling me your sister is the creature that I've feared most this past decade, so get back here and explain yourself. Narrator. Perry stops in his tracks. He hasn't heard anyone talk to him with such authority besides his sister for a long time. He turns around and walks towards the doctor and sits on a broken wing piece. Dr. Mustache then sits down as Perry summons a barrier above them blocking out the rain. Perry. So what questions do you have? Dr. Mustache, how powerful are you in Charlotte? Perry, well, I can't tell you much, but I will tell you that I am significantly scantily less powerful than her. Dr. Mustache, why? Perry, father won't allow it. Dr. Mustache, okay, who is your father? Perry, he is the creator of the multiverse. Narrator, the doctor's eyes widen as he says, the puppet master. Narrator, there is a moment of silence before the doctor's next question. Dr. Mustache, why did Charlotte want me dead? Narrator, Perry puts his hand on his chin as he thinks about this question before finally answering. Perry, she didn't want you specifically dead. She just wanted to kill anyone to temporarily quench your bloodlust. The one who wanted you dead was the puppet master, which is why he sent his royal assassin after you. Dr. Mustache. What did he, why did he want me dead? Perry, I don't really know. 
That's more of a question for my sister, Dr. Mustache. Oh, okay. Last question. Why did she show me mercy, Perry? I don't know, but I have a theory. The green paint in my belt heals people, but the black paint, black paint instantly kills them. But for some reason, the black paint heals Charlotte better than the green. And earlier, she had dispatched some really tough enemies. Dr. Mustache. I assume now would be a good time to apologize about Mecha Charlotte, right? Perry. No, it's alright. I understand that you're just trying to defend yourself. Dr. Mustache. Still, though, I apologize, because I get that you're her brother, and it must have been hard for you to hear that I had her locked up in some robotic contraption. Oh, that reminds me. I have another question, but please answer the first one. Perry. <sighs> Thank you for your apologies. Anyways... Still, even though the black paint healed her, it's still not healthy because the black paint still represents death. So I use some of my natural healing magic, which has positive effects on people's personalities. I And I have a feeling that with the amount I've been using on her, I brought back her empathy. Dr. Mustache. Huh. Interestingly, something I have been studying, or did study before that flower disappeared, was the positive effects healing magic can have on people, and if I could find a cure for cancer, too. Anyways, my question, ne my next question is, where have you been all this time? Obviously, you've been somewhere, because I've never seen you until the time you opened that portal in my home universe, when Isaac was going 100 miles over the speed limit. Perry. <laughs> that Isaac is really quite the person, isn't he? Anyways, I've been dead. Uh, Perry. Yeah, don't ask, because I don't even know. Anyways, can I have your phone number? Because I have to get going soon. Dr. Mustache. Yeah, me too. So my number is 809-249-6969. Thank you for clarifying this information for me. Perry. Oh, no problem. It was my pleasure. Narrator. The two proudly shake hands as Perry walks away and Dr. Mustache walks the other way. Perry walks closer to the airship as its presence grows larger and larger. For some reason, Perry gets a feeling of intense fear as he approaches it. The mighty cannon ship is a royal white with purple going along the side and it is a, as large as a castle. Perry seems like this is where Jolly's throne room is located. Let's see if there is anything I can salvage, or if they missed anyone here. Narrator. Perry walks through a hole in the bottom of the ship. It's dark and gloomy in there, and chains are hanging from the ceiling. He walks through a door into a courtroom. However, everything is turned over and destroyed. The paint on the walls is slowly peeling off. And there's planks peeled up, and the bench is destroyed to nothing but rubble. There's another hole in the wall. Blocking the door is a broken tom unit. Perry flings some black paint at it, causing it to melt down into dust. Perry, this courtroom looks like it has seen better days. I wonder what it was used for, because wasn't Jolly a ruthless dictator? Narrator, Perry grabs the gavel from the judge's desk. Perry, this will be a good present for a former royal judge that I knew. Narrator, he then opens the door into the dining room to the sight of death. The windows are covered with blood, and the once clean table is covered with plastic dinosaur shards. Bones are scattered throughout the floor from what looks like fallen skeletons. And as per usual, for a ship that fell 500 feet from the air, the side is dented, and everything is pushed to the side. Perry, wow, it looks like Dr. Mustache's troops and the dinosaurs tried to raid the ship, and if and it looks like they... Narrator, Perry pauses for a moment as he looks at the evidence on the ground from all the deaths, and it seems as if there were, was no victor. Perry, that's strange, maybe something else killed them. Narrator, he takes one of the blood-tinted royal golden plates and puts it in his bag with the gavel. As he walks up the stairs, he thinks about how hard life is for people who can't use the type of magic that he can, or can't, even use at all. 
and wonders what it would be like because he never feels in danger or threatened. He knows he can just make a portal and go home when threatened. The next room he walks into is a light blue hall, or at least was because the paint is now peeling off the walls and the majority of the doors are missing from the crash and a streak of blood is going through the middle of the room, leading to another dead body. Perry gets down on his knees next to this one. Perry, looks like this one managed to survive what happened in the dining room, but eventually died from blood loss. War never changes throughout my- War never changes. Throughout my life, I have served through many wars, and to be frank, I'm quite- b Quite dulled by the effects of seeing so many dead bodies in one area. Narrator, Perry stands up and begins walking through the dark hall. The lights on the ceiling keep blinking on and off, giving an unsettling feeling. As Perry walks down this hall, he ponders about all the wars he has served in. He served in five vi variations of World War One and Two, eight dinosaur revolutions, five great candy wars, and finally the pizza revolution, which was a war between Domino's and Little Caesars. Perry, <laughs> uh, truly the most ridiculous war I have ever served in. Narrator, this war was unique, though, because the kingdom that was being attacked had an aid from an entirely different universe. He feels guilty that he wasn't able to help that much with this one, though, because with most of the other wars he served for up to 10 to 30 years. Perry, it's sad because every single one of these people have a family. They have a life to get to, and hopes and dreams they want to fulfill, just to get the chance taken away by war. Best not to think of it, though. I gotta see if there are any other survivors. Thirty minutes later. Narrator. Perry doesn't see any more blood or death after the first floor, but he does finally hear a survivor on the floor before the last one. George. Hello? Is anyone there? Narrator, Perry runs towards the limping skeleton and comes to his aid. He lays him down on the floor as he puts his hands around his wounds, and green flashing lights sparkle all over the wound as it is almost instantly healed. Georgia looks up at his face with shock. George, you know, the doctor was looking for a legendary flower one time with an ability like yours. I think I saw it heal once, however, it took an extremely long time, when you healed me almost instantly. Perry, well, some are better at it than others. Narrator, he helps a skeleton off the floor. Perry, so how did you get stuck down here? George, a T-Rex stomped on my ribcage. Perry, ooh, that must have hurt. George, yeah, tell me about it. Anyways, do you know where the rest of Jolly's troops went? Perry, I believe they went home using the portal clicker thing. George, oh, that's great. Narrator, Perry opens a portal leading to Dark Realm number one. Perry, your home is right through this portal. Narrator, George is in shock. Once again, at seeing the sight of him, just open a portal to another universe. George, if I might ask, who are you? Perry, I'm Perry, guardian of the multiverse. George, all right, thank you, Perry. Narrator, he walks through the portal as it closes behind him. After this, Perry makes it to the top of the airship. He sees giant footsteps engraved in the wood, and it looks like a fight took place up here. Perry, so that must be the T-Rex that Skeleton was talking about. I wonder if it was Rexy, because that T-Rex is dead. Narrator, he knows this because a horde of people were mourning by its carcass. Perry follows the red rug into the golden hall, leading to a huge door. Perry opens this door into a long golden hallway, leading to another door. Perry, man, there's a lot of shattered glass in here. Narrator, he notices dents and bolts, bullet holes in the walls, and the large glass windows are shattered. Perry, it looks like a fight between three behemoths, behemoths happened here. Maybe this is where Jolly Neo Point 2 and John in his robot suit had their fight. Narrator, he then notices the T-Rex footprints on the floor. Perry, so that's how the, the T-Rex must have died. It looks like she must have been helping John. Narrator, he walks through the hall and opens the door to the throne room. Perry, wow, looks like literally every other throne room I've ever seen, except this one has seen better days. 
narrator. There's a throne at the end of the room and a golden chandelier shattered in the middle. There are also the two skulls next to the throne on golden pedestals. One is labeled King Chad and the other is labeled King of the Night Sky. Perry. Actually, I've never seen a throne room with skulls in it before. You know, I have actually now that I think about it. Narrator. He then hears tractors and what sounds like an enormous pile of money. He opens the door next to the throne to a giant room about 900 feet wide and 900 feet long and 900 feet deep filled to the brim with gold silver and copper the room itself is completely destroyed the ceiling and the wall to the right are gone perry sees goldie and mario swimming in the money as hundreds of trucks are collecting the money as they take it back to the indoraptors casino Perry almost trips on the riches multiple times on his way to Goldie. Perry. Hey, Goldie, how you doing, man? Narrator. Goldie sticks his head out of the, his large sum of money. Perry. Goldie. I didn't think you were coming back. Perry. Why would you think that? Goldie. Eh, I don't know. No reason. Narrator. He jumps out of the money, causing Perry to lose his balance. As money flies everywhere... He rolls down the mountain of money and lands on another pile of money where he can see Mario swimming on his back through the large sum of money. Perry, I'm sorry, but this is ridiculous. Why did Jolly just have a giant storage container filled to the brim with money behind the mighty cannon ship? Narrator, Goldie slides down the pile of money on his back and lands right next to Perry. Goldie, she was taking money from everyone who had more than one billion dollars and now that i was the first one to find this money hoard it makes me the richest dinosaur to ever live narrator both goldie and mario laugh maniacally as goldie says this perry don't you think that's a little greedy goldie finders keepers losers weepers pal Perry, ah, uh, Mario, but don't worry, you will be donating to the army to help those who fought in the war. Goldie, yeah, only one million dollars. Narrator, both him and Mario laugh as they clink their golden glasses full of grape juice together. Perry, I think it's funny that you say only one million dollars like it's not a lot of money. Goldie, well, I mean, we are the first octillionaires, right, Mario? Mario, Yahoo! Narrator, he dives through the money as he comes out of a random hill of cash and lands in front of Perry. Mario, is your sister still free? Perry, what? No! Are you crazy? Mario, but you said... M Perry, no! Narrator, Mario jumps in, in another pile of money like the conversation never happened. Perry, <sighs> how many times have I sighed since we have met? Goldie, a lot. Perry, yeah, that's how ridiculous collecting these stars have been. Anyways, how did one octillion dollars get in here? That's like 27 zeros behind the number one. For reference, Goldie, my guess is she raided a few nations before this one, but that's just a theory. Mario, a game theory. Narrator, he then flies into another pile of cash. Goldie, so I'm assuming you were helping those who had experienced injuries in the war, right? Perry, yeah, what about it? Goldie, did you see a red T-Rex by any chance? Perry, you mean Rexy? Goldie, yeah. Narrator, Perry looks down at the floor with a solemn look in his eyes as he says, Perry, no, she did it not make it. Narrator, there is a pause of silence in the room for a second. You can't even hear Mario swimming around in money. Goldie, oh. Perry, sorry for your loss. Narrator, Goldie looks off into the distance at the dark rainy clouds. Goldie, by chance, can you take me to where she lays? Perry, sure thing. Narrator, Goldie and Perry slide down the large pile of money like they're water slides as Goldie yells at Mario to make sure the trucks get all the money in his money bin before night. Mario, okie dokie, yahoo! Narrator, they land on the moist wooden ground of the Goldie the Casino Raptor realm as Perry takes Goldie across all the dead bodies, fallen jets, and blown up tanks and other war machines. Goldie, man, why does war have to exist? Why can't they all just open a successful business like me? 
Perry. Sadly, not everyone is as optimistic as you, Goldie. Narrator. They begin talking to each other about their adventures. Goldie tells Perry about his adventure on the Mighty Cannon Ship and what he assumes Isaac was doing. Perry. So I'm assuming it got on the second to the last floor. Goldie. Thankfully, because apparently some pretty chaotic stuff happened on the bottom floor from what I've heard. Perry. Yeah. Narrator. Perry then tells Goldie about the Forgotten Land and the Gate Guardian and Charlotte's battle with Mecha Charlotte. Goldie. Wait, did you say the Forgotten Land? Perry. Yeah, have you been there before? Goldie. I'd rather not say. Go Perry. Have you ever met the Gate Guardian before? Goldie. Two times. I know my dad met him many times before he before. The first time I met him, though, was at a royal court case, which is for the worst of the worst, and it was me against my old friend Mr. Porkwinder on trial for first-degree murder. The other time was when my family and my girlfriend needed to cross the fourth wall to get to some party set up by my stupid friend Mason Haggett using my gate pass. Perry, hold up. You've been past the fourth wall? Goldie, yeah, don't believe what they tell you. It looks just like here. Goldie, yeah, don't believe what they tell you. It looks just like here. Perry, really? Nothing's different? Just more giant furniture and dirty wooden floors? Goldie, yup. Narrator, they finally come up to Rexy's corpse. She has many burn wounds on her face and a seamless hole going through her torso out the other end. Perry, must have been from Jolly's plasma cannon. Narrator, Goldie sits down in front of the huge body as Perry sits next to him. She was truly gigantic, about the size of a school bus. Goldie, so let me tell you the story. Perry, which story is that? Goldie, the story of how my father died. Memory number 16, Mother, Part 2, Goldie the Casino Raptor. Narrator, the casino's on fire. Everyone has evacuated. Goldie is crawling on his hands and knees. Every time he moves his legs, it is like 100 knives stabbed in at once. Eli, Goldie, help! Narrator, the giant monster that they called Mother has Goldie's brother pinned to the ground. She is 23 feet tall and 72 feet long. She almost clamps her jaws around Eli's neck, just as Goldie chucks a poker chip at her face. She looks at Goldie and comes walking towards him, each one of her steps being as loud as Goldie's racing heart. Indominus, would you like to play my game too? <laughs> Goldie, no, I don't want to play your stupid game. Just get away from my little brother. And Dominus, and what can you do to stop me? You're broken, both inside and outside. You can't walk. And besides, I'm like 40 feet long. Then you am 13 feet taller. I destroyed an entire amusement park and brought pains to hundreds of creatures with my own two hands. So what can you do to me? Narrator, her ginormous presence towers over Goldie. Goldie finds himself at a loss for words. Indominus. That's right, nothing. Literally and figuratively, nothing. Narrator, she almost brings her head down on Goldie's skull, but then she hears a voice she can never forget, the voice of the one she hates most, Blue. Get the hell away from my son! Narrator, Blue jumps onto her and claws at her throat ferociously, but she grabs him off her throat and chucks him at one of the slot machines, causing it to explode. Goldie and Eli, father! Narrator, she slowly turns around and looks at Goldie, Indominus. Now you die! Narrator, Goldie rolls out of the way as Mother slams her face against the ground. Goldie, if you're going to kill me, then I ain't going to make it easy. Narrator, the Indominus roars, but something else roars at the same time that is much louder. Narrator, the Indominus turns around and faces Rexy. Indominus, I'll take care of you later, Goldie. Narrator, the two titans circle each other, looking for weaknesses as Eli runs up to Goldie. Eli, Goldie, we have to go! Goldie, but what about Dad? Eli, there's no time. We will come back for him later. 
narrator. Eli drags Goldie out of the flaming casino as Rexy throws the Indominus into the wall, causing it to fall down. The last thing Goldie hears is the roar of the two beasts as he leaves. End of memory. Perry, did you see your dad again after he was chucked into the slot machine? Goldie, yes, I remember staring down at him, looking him in the eyes as he lay there on the rubble, as he told me to take care of my brothers and to watch them like a hawk, as he closed his eyes and his heartbeat stopped. Narrator, there is a moment of silence before Perry asks him another question. Perry, what happened to Mother? By Goldie, by the way, that's not her name. Her name is Indominus. The reason I call her that is, well, that's who she is. My mother. She didn't care about us at all, though. And in fact, she tried to kill us. Perry, why, though? Why would a mother try to kill her own child? Goldie, well, answer this question. What would you do if you heard that a scientist used your DNA to make a child, but the other person that they used to make that child was the person you hated most? Huh. Goldie. You know what? Forget about it. All you need to know is that a Brachiosaurus crushed her to death. Narrator. There is silence again. Perry has seen families like this millions of times in his life. And he is thankful that he's had a loving father and a loving sister. Then he is reminded of something that he has felt sad about ever since he saw Charlotte again. The fact that he missed 50 plus years without her. Still, she can live forever, and he will easily be able to get those years back, but these were her first years when she was deciding who she was going to be, and he thinks that if he was there, she would be at least a little less bloodthirsty. Perry. Hey, Goldie? Goldie. Yes? Perry. Do you remember when he, we were walking around the one night on the Jolly Rogers universe, and he asked me if I could help you open casinos across the multiverse? Goldie, what about it? Perry, well, maybe I'll take you up on your offer. Narrator, a spark appears in his confident red eyes as he says, Goldie, yes, thank you so much. When would you like your first day to be? Perry, whenever I have time, I have been waiting to spend some time with Charlie before I start going on adventures like I used to do in the good old days. Narrator, Perry stands up. Perry, anyways, now I have to go. After all, I don't want to keep Charlie waiting. Goldie, alright, see you soon. Maybe next time I can introduce you to my Aunt Delta and my brothers. Narrator, Perry gives Goldie a high five as he opens a portal and goes home. Meanwhile... Narrator, Charlotte lies down on the couch upstairs as Isaac comes and sits on the chair next to the couch. The two melt into where they sat. It was so peaceful outside, too. No snowstorm, no hail, just peaceful silence. The two fall asleep for a couple hours as they remember peaceful memories. Isaac has a memory from a long time ago when he was a child when he was playing basketball at recess with Mason, Ethan S., and Gage. And Charlotte remembers when Perry would ho homeschool her. She remembers his shocked expressions whenever she was able to learn something in a matter of minutes. However, this was very hard to do because it was almost impossible to get her to focus. But somehow, Perry managed to do it. Charlotte wakes up before Isaac and checks her phone to see what time it is. Charlotte, oh wow, it's 2.30 already? What does? Why does time not exist? Narrator, she gets up and goes downstairs to put more wood into the fireplace to keep the house warm. She then sits on the old recliner next to the couch that Isaac usually sits on as she ponders to herself inside her head. Charlotte, I spared him because he was a good man. I thought he was someone that was wasting his life. Someone that thought he was invincible. Before I almost killed him, though, I saw a change in the doctor. Someone who didn't want help just for the popularity or the glory. He is now someone who genuinely cares about life. Isaac, so is that why you spared him? Charlotte, first of all, you don't startle me anymore. Second of all, how did you know what I was thinking? 
Isaac, wow, did you somehow wow hit yourself off in the head? Let's think about this question. Narrator, Isaac's sarcasm is overabundant right now. Isaac, so I can basically tell what someone is thinking by reading their expression. I can also read minds if you remember that time on the top of the mountain where you showed me your ghost form for the first time. Oh, and don't forget that stupid part in the first book where you gave me a part of your soul, which I explained what happened to that plot line in the Christmas special out of all things. Plus, I've been standing in the kitchen eating Takis for about 30 seconds as well. So yes, I know what your thoughts were in your mind. Narrator, Charlotte is stunned by her sudden stupidity. Charlotte, oh, sorry, I just woke up. Isaac, eh, yeah, me too. Narrator, Isaac sits down on the couch. Charlotte, so yes, that's why I spared him. Isaac, I've never known you to be that type of person to spare someone on a mission. I've always known you to be almost emotionless on missions. Narrator, there's silence in the room as Charlotte stares into the fire to try to think why she spared him. Isaac, you don't know, do you? Charlotte, yeah, I really don't. Narrator, Isaac has always known Charlotte to be the type of person to have an answer to everything, no matter how weird or chaotic it might be. But after reading her expression again on the couch, in front of the warm, cozy fireplace, he can see that the Charlotte that was always so sure about everything finally doesn't have an answer to their question. Isaac, so what were you and Perry doing while I was literally fighting in a war that had no significance to me whatsoever? Charlotte. Well, first me and Perry walked through all these neighborhoods, and we got to introduce ourselves to a lot of universe, the universe's natural inhabitants. Isaac. Nice. I got to introduce myself to a bunch of angry soldiers. Charlotte. Then we had a nice peaceful boat ride to this weird island that looked like someone's bedroom. And inside, there's a store that Perry said led to the Forgotten Land. Isaac. Wow, it's almost like the puppet master forgot what he named the place. So he just called it the Forgotten Land. Charlotte. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's how he named the Forgotten Realm, too. Narrator. The two laugh. Charlotte. Inside, there were these creatures that looked like the ones native to the realm with their plastic shiny skin, and they said that they couldn't die. Isaac, did you kill them? Charlotte, yeah. After Perry got abducted by one of them, and I almost got the life beaten out of me, but yeah, I killed them. Narrator, Isaac opens a can of Dr. Pepper at the as the contents fizz over onto the floor, and he doesn't care. He then burps at maxim maximum volume. Isaac, keep talking. Narrator, Charlotte slaps him before she continues. Charlotte, after that, we had to see the gate guardian. Isaac, did he try to kill you? I Charlotte, no, Isaac, not everything's going to try and kill us. In fact, he gave us a star willingly. It was almost like seeing an old friend. Isaac, nice. <laughs> Charlotte, then after me and Perry talked a little bit about some of his adventures through the, his billions of years of life, and we fell asleep on the cold wooden floor of that universe, Isaac, and let me guess, Mecha Charlotte ambushed you when you were asleep. Charlotte, yup. Isaac, and did you beat her? Charlotte, yup. Isaac, I had no doubt in that. Charlotte, I'll admit it was one of my toughest fights I've been in, and if not Perry wasn't there to help, I'd have been a lot bloodier right now. But not gonna lie, those dinosaurs were harder to kill than the Goofy A2000. Isaac, makes sense. After all, you did say that those weird dinosaurs couldn't die, right? Charlotte, yeah, it was weird. Usually these plastic dinosaurs don't bleed, but these ones did, which makes me think that they weren't from the, that universe. Still, I killed them somehow. I think the reason I was able to kill them was the fact that I was designed to be the living embodiment of death in this multiverse. Isaac, yeah, probably. Charlotte, so what was war like? Isaac, not fun. Charlotte, anything else? Isaac, it was war. What do you expect me to say? Sh narrator, Charlotte was expecting a more in-depth analysis of his adventure. Isaac, I killed some people and I blew up a nuke. That's about it. Narrator, then Charlotte's phone begins to ring and she picks it up. Charlotte, hello, who is this? Ethan S. Hey, Charlotte, it's me. Just curious, would you be able to bake a cake for Isaac's surprise birthday party? Narrator, she runs into the art room and closes the door behind her as she yells, Isaac's birthday is today!
Ethan S. Did you forget again? Charlotte, uh, yes. Ethan S. Well, all right. Just come to my house at 6.30 with Isaac and Perry, all right? Charlotte, okay, will do. Narrator, while she was in, while she is on the phone, Perry comes out of a portal into the middle of the living room where Isaac is. Perry, so how is Charlie doing? Isaac, I don't know. Man, this Dr. Pepper is good. Want some? Perry, do you even know where she is? Isaac, yeah, she's in the art room talking to someone on the phone. Perry, okay. Narrator, he sits down on the recliner Charlotte was sitting on before. Perry, so how was she doing? Narrator, Isaac gives him a rundown of their conversation. Perry, weird. Even if she doesn't have an exact answer to something, she's always to able to come up with some weird explanation. Isaac, I know, right? Narrator, then Charlotte comes running out of the door frantically. Charlotte, oh, hi, brother. Welcome home. Narrator, she gives him a quick hug. Charlotte, what did you do after we left? Perry, well, you see, I gets cut off. Charlotte, that's nice. Anyways, can you and Isaac go cut some firewood outside for me, please? Isaac, well, guess you have to go take me somewhere while Charlotte prepares a cake for my surprise birthday party that she just planned now because she forgot about it again. Charlotte, shut up, Isaac. Isaac, she didn't deny it. <laughs> Perry, can I at least have it gets cut off again? Charlotte, no. Narrator, the two walk out the screen door into the backyard as they close it quietly behind them. Perry, <sighs> happy birthday, Isaac. Isaac, thanks. By the way, is sighing at everyone's stupidity just going to become your catchphrase for now on? Perry, probably. Isaac, nice. Meanwhile, narrator, Ethan S. just finished setting up the table with all the plates and silverware, and now he's working on the burritos. Dr. Gage is sitting on a swirly chair in the middle of the living room, rolling around. Ethan S. lives in a log cabin that he made himself. Inside, there's a dining room just large enough for nine people, and a living room with a fireplace. The house has one bathroom, one bedroom, and a kitchen. Ethan S. Hey, Gage, can you sweep the floor for me? Dr. Gage. Yeah, sure. Narrator, he pulls a Roomba out of his pocket that goes around and absorbs all the dirt on the ground. Ethan asks, also, can you see if the bathroom is clean for me? Dr. Gage, yeah, sure. Narrator, he pulls a bathroom cleaning robot out of his pocket that flies over to the restroom. Ethan S. feels like his head is going to explode from all the noises going off in the kitchen. Then to add on to it, he hears Gage doing something that sounds like pounding. Ethan S., Gage, will you stop doing that? Dr. Gage, that's not me. Someone's knocking on the door. Ethan S. Oh! Narrator, Ethan S. goes get to get the door. He hopes the guest didn't come early. He opens the door to the sight of an old friend. Cars reel. Hey, Ethan! How you doing, man? Ethan S. Good, how you doing? It's been like 50 years since I've seen you, man! Dr. Gage. Uh, didn't he try to kill you last time he saw him? Ethan S. Nah, we're homies now, man. Dr. Gage. Uh, okay. Cars reel. Would you be willing to lend me a place to sit day? Ethan S. Sure thing, man. Cars reel. Thank you so much, dude. All right, guys, come on in. Ethan S. Wait a minute, you didn't. Narrator, he is suddenly trampled by Carsreel and ten skeleton soldiers as they walk in. Skeleton Soldier 3. Alright guys, let's party! Narrator, a disco ball appears out of nowhere. Ethan S. Hey, stop doing that! Skeleton Soldier 9. Ooh, this looks funny! Narrator, he tears a robot's head off. Dr. Gage. Hey, that robot was expensive! Cars reel. Oh, really? How much did it cost to make? Three cents. Cars reel. Oh, wow, that is expensive. Narrator. The skeleton soldiers go into the kitchen and consume every last thing that resembles food. Ethan S. You know those are decorations, right? Skeleton soldier four. Oh, really? Cool. Narrator, the house is now a disaster. All the plates are broken, the TV fell into the fireplace, and all of Gage's robots are destroyed, and the kitchen is completely decimated. Cars reel, alright, I gotta use the restroom. Let's just say that the 
toilet won't be the same after I'm done with it. By the way, I had Taco Bell. Dr. Gage, should we leave? Ethan S. Well, I guess this isn't my home anymore. Back to Isaac and Perry. Narrator. Isaac and Perry just finished chopping all the firewood, and now it's in very organized piles. They are now sitting on two chairs around a campfire in the cold backyard. Isaac. Man, it's chilly out here. Perry. If Charlie was out here, she would ask if you were, if you were, she could find ch the chili. Wait, what? If Perry was out here, she would ask you where she could find the chili. Narrator, the two laugh. <laughs> Isaac, so do you have all the stars? Perry, let's see. Narrator, five of the seven stars come out of his pocket and circulate around his wrist. Isaac has to look away due to how bright they are. Perry, does... Perry does too. Perry, I think Charlotte has the other two. Isaac, just put them away. Narrator, Perry puts them back in his pocket. Perry, Charlotte has ones from the jo Jolly and the Goofy Ah 2000. Isaac, alright then, so tomorrow we kill the void, eh? Perry, yup. Narrator, the two look into the campfire and admire it for a minute. All the different hues of orange and yellow bouncing up and down in a continuous rhythm. Perry, so my sister seems to be pretty fond of you. She even lets you call her Charlie. Isaac, eh, I have no idea why. She just made me her assistant one day, and now I just go on every single one of her adventures. And before you say anything, there is nothing romantic. Perry, do you like her at all? Isaac, <sighs> no, not at all. I just see her ever as my angry manager that forces me to do stuff I don't want to do. Perry, would you rather she not do that? Isaac, sometimes, but I will admit... My life here in the Forgotten Realm would be pretty boring without your angry sister, Perry. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. Do you think she likes you, Perry? Isaac? What? No! I'd be able to tell, too, because... Perry. Yeah, I get it. You can read people's expressions and know exactly what they are thinking. That's the ability of a royal judge. Isaac. Wait a minute. How do you know that I was a royal judge? Perry. I was there when your universe was created, buddy. Besides, how do you know that you were a royal judge? Isaac, well, that's just what Charlotte told me. Perry, did she tell you you had a brother and sister? Nope. Perry, then explain this. Narrator, he pulls the picture frame with the burrito picture out from his pocket and pulls the burrito picture out and throws it into the fireplace, revealing a picture of Isaac standing next to Michael and Veronica. Perry, checkmate. Isaac, okay, I'll admit it. I remember some things. Perry, oh, some things. I see. In that case, do you remember what a timeline is? Isaac, what's a timeline? Perry, oh, don't play dumb with me. It was literally your job to track the timeline in your old universe. Isaac, seriously, though, I don't know what a timeline is, and I don't remember it from my old universe. Perry, I get it. You're trying to protect me by not telling me information that you think will hurt me, but I've been alive for billions of years. I know that the world is a fantasy. I know about the spectators. I know about code, even. So please just spill out the information. Isaac, dot, 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 dot. Narrator, a red flame comes out of his right eye as his right eye's eye color changes to red and yellow circling around each other. His left eye turns black. His voice is suddenly deeper. The area around them turns pitch black, freezing the time and space continuum. Isaac, all right then, smarty pants. Look, I know that you and Charlotte know stuff about spectators and that the world's a fantasy and stuff, but code? That's a new one. How'd you learn about that, bucko? Perry. Well, my father, or as you know him, the puppet master, showed me Charlotte's code when he was creating her. Code is what determines a certain gimmick that a person does. For example, my gimmick is my want to not hurt others. The puppet master designed that to be my code. Isaac. All right, that was pretty close. Perry. Wait, what? Narrator. Isaac. Code determines a person's personality traits and their mental disorders, and it also determines whether they are an antagonist or a protagonist, and what part of the story they play a part in. And yes, gimmicks are another thing that have to do with code. 
Perry. Okay, none of that made sense. Narrator. Out of all the time Perry has been alive, he never heard the explanation of code like that. The way Isaac described it was like the directions of how to write characters in a book almost. Isaac. You're right, it didn't. And that was just a small part of the information I know. If I showed you the timeline, it would literally ruin your life. Perry, can you just show me the timeline? Isaac, did you not hear what I j Did you not hear the ruin your life part? Perry, I did. Can I see it now? Isaac, I think you're not getting something, buddy. Narrator, he lifts Perry up in the air using blue magic and brings him right in front of his face. Isaac, when I say no, I mean no. Narrator, then it's like the conversation that just went down never happened. Isaac is completely back to normal again, and Perry is seated in his chair. Isaac, so, what do you all those ink vials do? Perry, dot, 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 dot. Isaac, are you okay? It's almost like you just saw a ghost. Narrator, Perry begins to wonder if he was dreaming. Perry, uh, sorry about that. I think I just woke up from a dream. Weird. Narrator, Perry. The red ink deals damage. I can point, paint whatever shape I want in the air and send it flying at someone. Blue turns into water. The green is healing paint. Gold summons electric bolts. Purple causes people to fall asleep. White is a better green. And black kills instantly. But it can be used to heal a specific someone. Isaac, thanks for telling me because I've been wondering about those that are entire adventure. Perry, no problem. Narrator, that dream with Isaac earlier was one of the weirdest things Perry has seen in his adventurous life. He wonders what the extent of his knowledge is and how he can get him to spill the beans. Meanwhile, narrator, Charlotte takes the cake out of the oven and places it on the counter. All right, now it's time for the frost sting. Narrator, then she hears someone knocking on the door. She goes to see who it is. Ethan S. Yeah, we're kinda going to have to have the party here. Charlotte. What? Ethan S. Don't freak out. We can clean up and get everything ready while you bake the cake. Dr. Gage. And make the food, too. Charlotte. That's great. Narrator. The two walk into the house as Charlotte gets to work on the cake. But there's just one problem. Brownie consumed the cake. Brownie. Bark, bark. That was some yummy cake. Charlotte, get off the counter right now, Brownie. Narrator, Brownie runs up the stairs as fast as he can. Charlotte, well, that's great. Now I have to make another one. Ethanus, hey, Doc, how about you help Charlotte with the food? Dr. Gage, yeah, sure. Narrator, he pulls a cooking robot out of his pocket and it rolls over to the kitchen to help. Charlotte then walks over to the screen door and calls Perry in to help, but tells Isaac to stay outside. Isaac, but it's cold out here. Charlotte, nobody asked. Two hours later. Narrator, Isaac is chattering his teeth from how cold it is, but then he hears Charlotte open the screen door. Charlotte, all right, you can come in now, Isaac. Narrator, Isaac slowly walks in, chattering his teeth. But then he comes into the lots of warmth, warmth as he sees a banner hung for him that says happy birthday and the fat pizza guy, Gus, Tony, Dr. Grant, Dr. Grage, Ethan S., Perry, and Charlotte. Everyone, happy birthday, Isaac. Isaac, no way. You guys finally remembered this time. Charlotte, you can thank Smitty for the remembering part. Ethan S. If it wasn't for me, Charlie, Charlotte would have forgotten for the 15th time in a row. Narrator, everyone laughs in the room. Perry, that's not really funny. Guys, Gus, I feel like we're missing someone. Tony, Tony, ah, me too. <coughs> Narrator, in case you need a refresher, Tony is the honey man that is 187 years old and has no legs, which landed him in a wheelchair. The fat pizza guy, I know who we're missing. Where's the dinosaur? Charlotte, good point. Where is Goldie? Perry, really? You just now notice he's gone? He found his money, so he went home. Should I go get him? Everyone, heck yeah. Perry, all right then. Narrator, he opens the portal and enters it. 
Isaac, all right, before we get this party started, there's something I want to do. Charlotte, and what might that be? Narrator, Isaac teleports somewhere. Gus, where did he go? Charlotte, just wait one second. Narrator, he teleports back into the house on top of a giant firecracker inside of a cannon. Charlotte, Ethan S., I told you we were doing the rocket. Ethan S., I didn't even tell him about it. Isaac, I just read his expression. Narrator, the cannon fires the firecracker into the air. As Isaac holds on tight as he flies through the ceiling, he can feel the wind hit his face as he jumps off and teleports somewhere. The firecracker explodes 500 feet above the ground into a beautiful array of lights, each one twinkling with beauty. Each light Little light, full of personality. Everyone that day was filled with great joy. As the fireworks faded away, everyone, wow, that was beautiful. Charlotte, Isaac! All rights reserved to Casino Co.